Welcome back to a brand new edition of Views from the Booth. I'm your host, Reed Decker. And joining me today, he is a contributor to fanside.com, Brett Shaves, and co-host of 643 podcast, Alex Green. Uh, first, thanks guys so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Reed. Absolutely. Thanks again, Reed. No problem. Um, so today, uh, the day after the NFL divisional round playoff games. So let's just jump right into it. The first one uh, from Saturday, Packers defeating the Rams 32 to 18. So this game, uh, considering the weather conditions, I mean, with how cold it was, I mean, the Rams stayed pretty close into this game uh, late into it. Jared Goff surprised me considering after his thumb surgery played pretty well. Um, the biggest thing that shocked me was uh, this Rams number one defense uh, was a no-show. I mean, you had Aaron Donald coming out into, during the second half and didn't really play that much after. And it was the Packers defense that really stood its ground. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the big things, like you mentioned, Reed, was this, pa- this Rams defense just didn't really come to play at all. I mean, you saw Jalen Ramsey on Devonta Adams' first touchdown showing – very visible frustration trying to cover Adams is obviously a tough thing to do on its own. But when you add all these extra components and trying to stop all these other green Bay Packer weapons, it's just almost impossible to do. So the fact that, you know, Jalen Ramsey almost had to cover Devonta Adams one-on-one on every single play was just tough. And you could see the frustration through every single player on that defense. So just going into this game, I thought the Packers had a good shot as it was, but seeing the way they played going into the second half as well just goes to show that Green Bay needs to be taken very seriously if you haven't taken them by, seriously by now. And I don't see anyone else beating them. I mean, we have Tampa Bay next week, but it's going to be a very tough challenge for them. Yeah, and the Rams' defense was part of the reason why I thought the Rams would be able to keep this game close. And they, like Reed said, they just did not look like a number one defense out there. Uh, Aaron Rodgers had a great game in that Packers offense is really has a lot of weapons uh, ways and ways that it can hurt you with Devontae Adams and Robert Tanyan and Marquez Valdez Scantling and, and even uh, Lazard made a couple of huge catches uh, down the late in the game. So this Packers team is uh, like you said, Brett, one that should be taken very, very seriously and one that should be a real contender uh, to win next week and maybe even win the Super Bowl. Absolutely. I think we're all in agreement there. We'll get to the picks a little later on, but um Let's move right along then. So uh, the Bills beating Baltimore in that nightcap on Saturday, 17-3. to three. Um, So I actually had Baltimore winning this game, but the Bills – so first of all, Bills' first AFC championship game since 1994 versus, albeit now, Kansas City. But for this game, the clear factor for me was the wind. Uh, in Buffalo, you had Justin Tucker missing – uh, I believe it was two, yeah, two different field goals early in the game. And at that point, it would have been – and Buffalo, by the way, you had missed one as well in the first half. It would have been 9-6, if I'm getting that correct, Baltimore at halftime if they had made those uh, field goals. So, I mean, that's a whole different ball game. And, I mean, just right there from the start, I mean, the Ravens just didn't look like themselves. And Lamar Jackson, I think those questions from him throwing from the pocket is still legitimate. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest things too, in this game, um, like you said, Reed, uh, you had to take, you had Baltimore uh, winning this game. I thought Baltimore could have legitimately won that game too. Uh, But I think the biggest thing was Lamar Jackson not being present later in that game. Obviously Tyler Huntley, you know, you have to come in and, you know, you have all those high expectations to try and come back and score 14 points within one quarter, nearly impossible to do as a backup quarterback with those, with not getting those starter reps in practice. It's so tough to do that pick six that Lamar threw uh, in the second half, almost a dagger to the heart. I mean, having a 101 yard pick six go against you. It's just, it's, it's tough to come back from and seeing that Ravens team play in the second half, it just didn't look like the same team we saw against Tennessee. No, they really didn't. And I think, I think the Bills came into this game preparing to having to stop the run because that's what the Ravens are strong at. I mean, you have J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards as well as Lamar Jackson, who is obviously uh, very – has his legs are obviously a huge weapon and something he uses very frequently. But the fact um, – something I want to mention is that in the divisional round game against the Titans, Lamar Jackson had, on, had like, a, I believe, 195 passing yards and like over 100 of those were to Marquise Brown. 
So if Marquise Brown gets locked down by someone, which, well, I mean, wasn't sort of the case in this game because he had a decent game, but I mean, the Ravens just really had no other options and receivers threats besides Marquise Brown. I mean, you have Mark Andrews, you have Willie Snead, but you know, compared to the Bills who have uh, Cole Beasley and uh, Gabriel Davis, those I would take and Cole Stephon Beasley and, mm-hmm. and Davis over um, Andrews and uh, Snead any day of the week. But yeah, I think Lamar really got to work on his pocket passing because it really isn't the good. And it's, I think it's one of the, his weak point, uh, one of his weak points in this game. So definitely, definitely, I thought the Ravens could have won this game too, but um, the Bills impressed and Josh Allen continued to look good and continued his almost MVP type form in this game. So. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think the Ravens are going to ha- definitely have to address their lack of wide receiver uh, need to come the off season to get further into the playoffs to come next season. Um, but if you remember at the, towards the end of this game, uh, Baltimore had the ball when Huntley came in and threw a right down the sideline. I don't remember who the receiver was, but he was wide open, and but he just overthrew him. If you it was Marquise Brown, Marquise Brown. If you just, if, I mean, I don't know if it was because if the wind just took it just over, if he just overthrew him, but that could have been. They probably would have gotten. They were. They would have been right in back in it if you had Tyler Huntley coming in and throwing that dime. It would have been a whole nother ball game too. That's just. I don't. I think he just overthrew him. I don't think it was the wind, but. Yeah, was... I also agree. I think he. I think he just overthrew him. That was a very pretty ball that he threw. If Marquise Brown just had it by a little bit more, or if Tyler Huntley just threw a little more softer, probably, like you said, Reed, they would have been right back in that game. Ten, ten to seventeen. That's a ball game, and one stop by the Ravens on defense late in that fourth quarter, whole different ball game. Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right. So then on su- comes Sunday. Uh, this was. More of a surprising uh, closer game in, from what I had thought. Uh, Chiefs beating Cleveland 22-17. Um, obviously, the biggest story here is Patrick Mahomes leaving the game with a concussion and not returning. And then Chad Honey taking over uh, and completing a first down late in the fourth quarter, which sealed the game. Um, there's a couple things that I want to address here, though, uh, on Cleveland's side. Obviously, there's that controversial in the first quarter, the no call of the helmet to helmet uh, when the ball went out of bounds in the end zone, which should have been a helmet to helmet call that was missed by the officials. But I think I've seen some people saying that that decided that that was the reason Cleveland lost because of the way the score turned out. But there was a couple of uh, late fourth quarter time clock management uh, coaching decisions by Stefanski that uh, I wasn't in favor of. And let's see what you guys say. Uh, First of all, um, when he's challenging the clear complete in the fourth quarter, he he challenged the completion that was pretty clear and obvious. I mean, it didn't touch the ground and he held onto it against his body and he's challenging it and he loses a timeout. At that point, you waste a timeout. it's, you only have two left, and then by the time you get the ball back, at least from what I'm remembering, he only had one left. That was one, and then the other one was um, he punted the ball with four minutes left, and the way the game was going, from the way it was going, Kansas City really couldn't stop uh, the Chiefs. I know, understand that Chad Henney was in, and that it's a completely different drop off. But the way their defense was playing against Kansas City with Tyreek Hill still on the field and Travis Kelsey and Sammy Watkins, it just felt like you knew they weren't going to get the ball back, which was exactly what happened. And they iced the game. What do you guys think? To me, I think that That Rashad Higgins, you know, controversial call, whatever you want to call it, was a huge factor in the decision. But I think, like you said, Reed, it all came down to those coaching decisions by Kevin Stefanski towards the end of the game. You know, a a game could be broken or it could be made just based on those calls. I mean, we've seen it through other various teams throughout the regular season this year. And like you said on that incompletion, that incomplete pass that, you know, he challenged 
or complete pass, whatever it may be. Um, I didn't agree with the decision either. Um, you know, wasting a timeout and something like that is something you don't want to do, especially in a close it wasn't game like even that. Close. The completion. It was like oh, oh agreed, yeah. Um, but just wasting timeouts like that, especially in that close of a game, you cannot afford a loss like that. I mean, every timeout is valuable in that situation. Seconds could make or break a play. I mean, we've seen teams get off free plays before the two minute warning just because of timeouts or lose a play before the two minute warning. Those play those kinds of things make or break your team late in the fourth quarter. So Regardless of that, you know, call happened to helmet to helmet, um, those game time, those game management decisions that Stefanski made may have cost Cleveland the game as well. Yeah, people, I think people can point, point the fingers at the uh, helmet to helmet call all they want, but it's really uh, the Kevin Stefanski and some of the decisions he made that really uh, led the Browns to, I think, that loss or led the Chiefs to that win, whatever you want to, how you want to put it. Um, I thought this game was going to be close because, because, not, I mean, I'm, obviously the Chiefs' offense has so many weapons and so many ways that they can hurt you. I mean, Travis Kelsey, Tyree Kill, Sammy Watkins. But, um, you know, I thought the Browns with Hunt and Chubb and then uh, Jarvis Landry as well would be able to put up a fight, and I thought this game was going to be close. So, But if I'm not mistaken, yeah, in this, but in this case, though, as the game went on late into the second half, fourth quarter, I mean, Cleveland couldn't run it at all. Yeah, that's true. They just, I mean, they, they had to rely on the pass. And then that was the other thing. Like, they were just wasting downs, getting no yardage, if anything, maybe losses. I mean, that's that's just other thing. That's just, yeah. Mm. Um, but, I mean, the other thing is, like, Mayfield, surprisingly to me, though, I mean, he to go on the road into Kansas City in an environment like that, I mean – if you're Cleveland, you have, I think you have your guy now. I know that there's been a lot of speculation since that draft, that year of the draft took place of which quarterback is the one. I think Cleveland found its man. And um, I think just to go into the atmosphere, their environment pretty much nailed it down. Um, mm. But uh, let's go on to then the nightcap on Sunday. Uh, Tampa Bay beating, which was really the game of the week weekend uh tampa bay beating new orleans 30 to 20 so in this game uh, i mean drew Brees pretty much come especially i guess later in the game but the turnovers for new orleans really was the difference here i mean new orleans three turnovers to tampa is none uh and on top of that new orleans Get uh, not getting pressure on Brady and uh, Tampa getting pressure on Febreze. I mean, it felt like first of all in the first half this game just felt like a like a defensive slash nobody has, was able to find their way in the first half on the offensive side of the ball. And um, but come the second half, I mean, New Orleans just looked like shot. Mm-hmm. Like I said last week too, Reed, um, the biggest thing that I was concerned about with Tampa Bay was their defense. Very young, a lot of questions to be answered in the secondary. Based on this game, they answered quite a few of those questions. I was very impressed on how uh, this Tampa Bay secondary played, you know, picking off Drew Brees on multiple occasions, which is, you know, something we don't see often from Drew Brees. Um, but in this case, it did happen. Um, and I really was impressed with the fact that Tom Brady kept his tempo consistent throughout the game, especially in the second half. Um, first half started off a little rocky, but he found his way. Um, and Tom Brady managed to lead this offense to a, a pretty good win in taking down Drew Brees here. The other thing is, how is, if you're New Orleans, Michael Thomas gets no catches. He can't catch one pass. He gets targeted four times, but he can't catch one ball. You're in the AFC, in the NFC divisional round. And, I mean, that's your top receiver. <laughs> That's a big problem. I mean, especially if you have a number one receiver like him, who's pretty much 100% after being out through the majority of the regular season. That's a big problem. Um, not giving him those, you know, even more targets or just catches alone. That's something you have to work on. And whether or not Drew Brees comes back next season, a priority for that offense has to be finding a way to get Michael Thomas the ball and letting him just do his thing. Yeah. It seems, it always, to me, it seems like Tom Brady always, you know, starts playing very well, even if he hasn't had the best regular season in the playoffs. Uh, I mean, he's done it in New England for a 
you know, a couple of years, obviously getting six Super Bowls there. But I think this more. this Bucks this this Bucks defense uh, really impressed me, especially I know you pick like uh, Brett said, picking off Drew Brees twice in the same game, which really rarely happens uh, when you have a quarterback like Brees. Um, you know the Bucks offense, Mike Evans have a lot of the Bucks offense has a lot of uh, weapons on there. You know Mike Evans, uh, Leonard Fournette, and Ronald Jones look both looked pretty good that game as well. So um, I don't know how they'll do against Green Bay next week, but should be a good game. Um, and then just f- finishing up on this to wrap a bow on it, uh, Drew Brees, not a good way to go out uh, in this game, which will likely be his last game. It's, it's all expected that he'll retire. And um, it's actually, in fact, he was on the field late last night with his kids and family after that game up to the fact that Tom Brady came out. So it does sound like uh, Drew Brees is going to call it quits and head over to the broadcast booth of NBC. Um, So let's now look ahead now to the championship week. Uh, There's two games. So we'll start with uh, Buffalo in Kansas City. So for this game, for me, the big factor here is going to be, I'm looking at the wide receivers. You have Stefan Diggs and Tyree Kill on, on both sides. Uh, I think this game is going to be pretty, it's going to be a close game. Um, I honestly think, I, while I understand that Buff, uh, Buffalo's defense was able to shut down Baltimore, I think you're going to have a high, close scoring game. And it might very well come down to who has the ball last. But I have to go with Kansas City here just because I, I'm pretty, I, there's no way, first of all, that uh, Andy Reid's not going to play Patrick Mahomes. And secondly, their weapons just, even though Buffalo has Stefan Diggs and Cole Beasley, Kansas City's just on another level, another, just not even close. I think this game is going to come down to whether or not Patrick Mahomes plays. I think if he is like medically okay to play, there's no doubt my man Andy Reid will star him on that championship weekend. But if he's showing signs that, you know, he's not all there and he's not mentally ready to go yet, there's a chance Chad Henney starts Sunday. But the chances right now, if he shows signs of progression throughout the week, I very well think Mahomes is going to play. And if Mahomes does play, there's a chance, in my opinion, that Kansas City will win this game. Like you said, Reed, it's going to come down to, you know, a very offensive scoring game, back and forth. And it may well be a factor of who has the ball last and who has a chance to score that game winning touchdown or field goal, whatever it may be. Um, but if it's coming down to the two teams, um, if Mahomes plays, I think Kansas City's going to end up winning this game. Yeah. I'm, ha- I'm going to have to be with the both of you. I like Brett. I think this game comes down to whether or not Mahomes plays. I think if Mahomes doesn't play the bills, I think could very well easily win this game because Josh Allen has been playing, uh, you know, to an MVP type season, like I mentioned earlier. And, yeah, you look at the Chiefs' offense, they just have so many more weapons than I think the Bills do. We have Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill, like we mentioned earlier. So if Patrick Mahomes is uh, able to play, and I think Andy Reid will start him. Plus, I think uh, I give the coaching advantage to the Chiefs as well with Andy Reid over McDermott and Buffalo, who has done a great job there in the past couple of seasons. But Andy Reid is one of the greatest coaches in the league right now. So I'm going to have to give – I'm going to have to go with Kansas City winning this weekend as well, if Mahomes plays. Yeah, I mean, just, just... – Look at what he did on uh, Sunday just to go uh, go for it. On fourth and one. Fourth and one, basically, right around midfield. If you don't get it, then you're giving Cleveland a short field to play with. Um, the other thing I'm just going to say on this is I can't see – I just can't see a way that uh, Kansas City doesn't play Mahomes. I, I, I don't – to play in an AFC championship game, I just don't – I don't see – I just can't see it happen. Um, so let's then move on to the NFC side of it for the championship weekend. Uh, Tampa Bay heading up to Lambeau Field and play the Green Bay Packers. Uh, so first of all, it's going to be 24 degrees uh, with a chance of snow for the high on that Sunday. Um, obviously, it's Brady and Rodgers. And Green, the state of Wisconsin is going to be allowing fans again into the stands. So here's what I'll say about this. If there's any quarterback out of the ones that could have beaten, that can beat the Packers in, in Lambeau in those weather conditions, 
I would have to say would be Brady. Just looking at what he's, he's done for 20 years in New England. Um, I think it, it's so, I think you're going to have another high scoring game of pretty much no defense. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm going to have to go with Green Bay, but I'll say this, I'm not going to be surprised any, in a, a, at all if Tampa Bay winds up taking this one, though, just because they have Brady. Mm-hmm. In the three games that they have played in the past, Brady does have the head-to-head record 2-1. to one. Um, I think this game is going to be all about tempo. I mean, Brady's no stranger to weather conditions like this, and certain conditions like this require a certain pace that the game should be run at. You know, you don't want to be too aggressive because there's a chance that, you know, balls could be dropped or fumbles, whatever it may be in this cold weather. So I think it's going to all depend on whether or not Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady is going to keep a good pace in this game. At this point in the season, with fans being allowed at Lambeau Field now, I'm going to take the Packers in this game. Um, I still think that, you know, even though they performed very well last week, I still think that Aaron Rodgers can tear apart this Buccaneers defense and secondary uh, pretty easily. Uh, if Tom Brady can manage to go back and forth, I think it could be a very well high scoring game, but I'm going to have to go with the Packers on this one. Yeah. I'm going to have to go with the Packers as well. Like uh, you guys mentioned, Brett and Reed, Tom Brady is no stranger to snow and cold weather uh, playing in new England for 20 seasons. Uh, he's had his fair share. He's played in his fair share of snow games before. So uh, I think like we said, if anyone, if there's any quarterback that is like handled, played to handle to play in this, whether it's Tom Brady, um, I'm going to have to go with the Packers as well. Uh, you know how you have Aaron Rodgers, who is most likely going to be the MVP of this season. He's been playing in an, on, on an unreal level. And I think the Packers just have too many weapons. Uh, Devontae Adams, Marquise, Valdez, Scantling, Robert Tanyan. I mean, Tampa so, has their weapons too, but I mean, it's just. Yeah, but, yeah, but I mean, you look at last weekend, the Packers tore up the Rams defense, which was like the but one of the better defenses in the league, if not the best. So I think I'm going to have to go to Green Bay. I think Aaron Rodgers will tear up, uh, like Brett said, will tear up this Buccaneers defense. And it could be close. I think Tom Brady might be able to, you know, keep it close. But I think eventually, I think it'll go to Green Bay. Yeah. Uh, the other only side note to mention on this matchup is these teams played each other once this past season and Tampa Bay ran away with it in the blowout. But it's completely different scenarios here uh, come this time around. So we all agree there with Green Bay in that one. Uh, but right before we go, we're going to talk about the, the latest with Deshaun Watson because there's some new information that has been coming out about his situation of wanting out in Houston. So the latest that we've been hearing is that people uh, – in the organization believe that he has played his last snap with the Texans and that there have been internal discussions with, uh, with in the Texans organization that they are looking at possible trade partners and what the quarterback position could look like going forward. Here's the one thing that I want to say about this, because there's been a lot of talk, obviously there's a lot, and we talked, I mean, Brad, you were on last time when we talked about this, but there's been a lot of discussion about who has the best, who has the best package, who has the best offer, who can do this, who can do that. The bottom line here is that yes, the Jets have the best offer, but Deshaun Watson has the leverage here because the Texans gave him that no trade clause in that contract that he just signed. I'm pretty sure it was in September. So he is going to be able to dictate where he can go. Um, so Houston could wind up getting not maybe the greatest offer because what it sounds like from his camp is that he wants Miami and that um, two where you would have two are going back to Houston. So personally, that's what I could see happening right now. We haven't heard what else he would be available or open to, but I could very well see the Jets getting being an odd man out here. Mm-hmm. I think that just seeing Watson's scenario right now, I mean, the latest that's come out is that he's not, he's not answering any phone calls. Uh, there have been other head coaches saying that this position that's vacant right now in the Houston organization is so undesirable considering that, you know, the situation with the GM and now Watson not being uh, happy. His anger level going from a two to 10, um, what he recently tweeted out. I think that, you know, regardless of who may have the best deal or, 
who could offer the best package to Houston, like you said, Reed. The bottom line is whether or not Deshaun Watson wants to dictate where he can go because he has that no trade clause, like you mentioned. Will Miami want to give up to a tug of Viola? I don't know. It's been one season. He's shown flashes of being good. He's shown flashes of being not that great. It's going to depend on whether or not they're ready to let go of him yet and really push this organization forward to a win now franchise quarterback instead of developing someone like Tua. Well, if I'm Miami, I take that deal. Go ahead, Reed. I would. No, if, 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 yeah, if I'm Miami, I would definitely, I would give up Tua. You're getting a guy right in the middle of his prime who's been, who's proven that he can perform at a high level. Uh, the question that I'll ask back to both of you or whatever is that if you're the Jets then, if let's assume just for whatever that uh, Watson says he's willing to go to the Jets. Or if you're the Jets, do you give up on Darnold and go with Watson? If I'm the Jets, I mean, I would – if I'm getting Deshaun Watson, I would definitely have to do that. I mean, you're getting the guy in your prime again. And for – uh, Darnold, while there's been some debate about who his supporting cast is, we've seen some good signs and some not so good signs. So, mm-hmm. I actually yeah, think I feel like. Be... Go ahead. I was I was gonna say I feel like the Jets are in a similar situation with with Tua. You know, Sam Donald's been in the league for a couple of seasons now, and his supporting cast hasn't been the greatest. But I mean, if you're getting a guy like Deshaun Watson, who like Reed said is like in the middle of his prime right now, and is one of the, I would say. A, top 10, top 15 quarterback in the league right now, um, then I, if you're on the Jets, I'd do that deal. Uh, yes, uh, you would have to give him some help on the offensive side of the ball um, and some former receivers, but if I'm the Jets, I would do whatever I can to get Deshaun Watson. You would also have to probably give up. So you give up the two, uh, the Sam Darnold, and then probably Seattle's picks that you got, and next year's first rounder, I would assume as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. So you're giving up the farm, but uh, if you're the Jets, it's probably, it's definitely worth it. Um, Just from my speculation, I can't think of, I mean, we don't know what other teams he's, that have been thrown out from his side. Um, I'm just, I don't see him going, first of all, I, I think it's pretty, first of all, let's just say this, first of all, I think it's a pretty gone foregone conclusion now that uh, Watson will be dealt some point this come this off season. Um, from what it sounds like, as Brett mentioned, this relationship is pretty much irre- is not fixable at this point. Um, I just think that um, if you're Houston, you this I mean this the way this organization has been run. First of all, this. So you're Deshaun Watson. You've been you got lied to this time around with the GM hire, and you got your best receiver last year taken away in a trade. Uh, pretty self-explanatory why this might be it, the least uh, attractive job out there right now. Um, let me throw this out to you. I Brett, I know we talked about this last time, Alex. If you're the Patriots or if you're Houston, actually, in this case, and the Patriots come to you, um, I'm assuming, so you would, if you're the Patriots, you're giving up, uh, you probably have to give up multiple first rounders, first of all, along with Stephen Gilmore. But if you're Houston, here's my thing. I'm looking at those first rounders. I'm assuming that Bill Belichick takes Deshaun Watson, okay? And then I'm assuming he'll, so then he'll, restock with the wide receiver position. They'll have their guys come back from the defensive side of the ball with, from the opt-out. So they'll probably be another legitimate threat in the AFC East again into the playoffs. If you're Houston, I don't know if I would really want that offer because you're getting those first round picks, but those, if, when I'm looking at it, those picks will probably be towards high, uh, not high, but low picks towards the end of the first round. You're giving up uh, gener- uh, well, not I don't know, gener- but a, a top tier talent at quarterback. I don't know if the Patriots really have anything to throw out there if you're getting him. Then, yeah, that's true. You make a very good point. I think the Patriots will make some kind of offer to the to Houston for the Sean. I think they would be stupid not to, since they 
they're going to need a quarterback since they're most likely not going to re-sign Cam Newton, um, which is for better or worse, you know, Patriots fans are 50-50 on that. A lot of them say that, are glad that he's leaving. But, um, yeah, it's just a matter of if, he was, if you're Houston, do you want to do that trade? Uh, the pick this year is somewhere in the middle, I believe, around 15 or 16. And then, like you said, if New England does get the Sean Watson and they restock their receivers and get their players back, they'll probably be another, they'll probably be a threat in the AFC again. And um, those picks that the Houston's getting are probably going to be low, low, uh, later picks in the first round and later picks, like you said, Reed. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if that's a page, if I'm the Patriots, I do that deal. And if Houston accepts that deal, I do it. But I don't think I don't Houston, know if Houston would do that. that. That's, yeah, you make a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's uh, the Deshaun Watson thing is definitely going to be something worth monitoring as the soft season develops. I may just say one thing before. Um, as of right now, they are actually heavily considering Eric Bieniemy as their next head coach. If they do end up hiring Eric Bieniemy, that's probably their last hope to get Watson back. Is I know he was originally the candidate that Watson wanted to replace Bill O'Brien. Um, so if they do end up signing Bieniemy uh, for the next head coach, that's probably the last resort you might see Watson come back. But at this point, I think it's almost impossible to get him back. But I, I just want to say one thing, because I, I was watching uh, Dan Orlovsky this morning on ESPN. He was saying that it's much worse than it's already, that's already been reported out there. And basically that he just has to get out of there. So if I'm just going based off of that, I – at this point, even if they get the enemy, I, I just think from what everything's been reported on, I, I just can't see him staying. It'll, it'll be a Hail Mary shot for Houston on their part, but mm-hmm. I, I just, I, I can't see, at, I can't see him uh, coming back because he hasn't, he hasn't officially like requested, I want out, like forcing a trade yet, but it does feel like we're heading down that path. And it, it ultimately, what I think what could wind up happening again is then he'll probably just wind up uh, holding out come training camp. Mm-hmm. Um, but that'll definitely be worth something to monitor uh, as the off season continues after the Super Bowl. But that is all the time we have for you today. Uh, for Brett Shaves and Alex Green, I am your host, Reed Becker. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And we'll see you next time on a new edition of Views from the Booth.